This is the J.R. Hendrick Texan Gentleman podcast that deals with the early in the life of my alter ego, J.R. Hendrick. This episode is in a narrated format, commentary by myself and J.R. Relax and enjoy the adventure. Take care. God bless. Welcome to uh, J.R. Hendrick Texan Gentleman. Uh, with me, and this one is uh, <clears throat> a friend of JR's named Brent Clark. <laughs> um, JR is on assignment. It bet just keep it a pet. <laughs> I think so too. So, since we don't have JR like we originally planned, um, <clears throat> Brent, could you give his account? Sure. Mad as hell. This is uh, the first. Mad as hell. Jim called him the afternoon of the 31st, saying he had it with Washington, D.C. Had it with Claude. Declining his invitation to Baton Rouge. So Daddy told me that Mama was leaving the night of the 31st to go to Dallas and then flying in the morning to meet him in Baton Rouge. It was obvious to me that Daddy was homesick for West Texas. <laughs> Probably the South. 7 a.m., at 14 Heritage Gate, Jim and his dream team are packing to go to Baton Rouge, where he would be interviewed by Andrew House with John Sestina. 1 p.m. Central. Mary Jane, the Hendrick is Satan Baton Rouge. Jim is on the Andrew House show where he uh, blasted Bill Mayer for calling him Phil Later's uh, errand boy. John Sestina took it further, attacking. The half mule approach of the Clinton administration toward the economy. Three PM in the parlor at Miller Jane, Jim and Betsy talk. And she says, Keep it up and Claude and Janet are going to be persona non grata around us, as he said. And, and Jim's like, I don't like being used. I gave Claude Kyle the least thing he could do is do me a solid. And She said, Bessie says, I knew you'd say that. So, Andrew and uh, Margaret House, the house, they have carte blanche here and anywhere where we go. And, and Jim's like, well, he, he's got to fly back to Dallas tomorrow to do his show. And I'm canceling my show with Blake Carter on Tuesday. He's gone off the deep end again. <laughs> well, I don't think that has happened, Brent. That's obvious. He gives uh, Blake Carter another chance. Whether or not he shines, I don't know. 
And she says, Jim, I know you miss me. I wish I could come with you. And Jim's like, well, why don't you? And Betsy's like, I can't. Give me time. I still have to process things with Mama. Okay, so at 7 p.m., the Dream Team comes uh, back with dinner after dinner for photo ops. Okay, so there we go. And we skip. All goes well. We skip the second. Now, here's the third. 9 a.m. Central. Louisiana Christian University. Jim is giving a platform speech at a Phil Graham rally. He pins his hopes on Graham winning the Louisiana primary. 12 p.m. The rally being over. Uh, Clara Luss approaches Jim. Let me drive with you and your entourage to Baton Rouge. I flew in early to see you, Clara said. Fine. Come on board. But you're going to sit in the limo behind me and Betsy. You know what I noticed? I noticed that, you know, when Betsy's not around, he's been conciliatory and downright sweet. But Betsy's with him as well. She's with his wife. <laughs> of course. Of course, what we don't know is Claude does come to see him in Baton Rouge. They make up. <laughs> it's an on and off again cycle, something that JR can never understand. 3 p.m. Jarrah's in his dorm room. Kevin McDonald is studying at the library. Brent, the day before, Kevin took him with Steph, Seth Goggins to do some book shopping. He thought he was joking with me. When he said Dr. Harmon and Christy Murray were having an affair. But over time, Jarr saw that the cam campus gossip was true. <sighs> Just seems like that this professor is kind of like a woman as of. Well, you get all kinds. University, love, war, and politics. Okay, suddenly Jarrah's cell phone rings, and it's Charlie. And he's like going, and he says, "Did you get the? Did you get a wedding invitation?" And and Jarrah's like, "Yeah, so what?" And Charlie says, "We have to be there, March sixteenth at Little Rock." To wish them well. And and Jarrah's like, Charlie, she broke my heart. Declined the invitation. Okay. Dang it, Charlie. Dang it. I have no choice. You're you're being stupid again, so I have to give you the bell. I mean, Charlie was so annoying. And that's why sometimes I had to be firm with JR to steer him in the right way. 6 p.m. At a steakhouse, Chip is having dinner with his entourage. Sitting next to Clara. And Betsy sits with Grace Arthur. It was a beautiful time for all. Of course, Claude was present. 
4.50 a.m. Central. At the airport, Jim talks to Clara as they get ready to board the plane. And, and, and Jim says, I'm surprised you want to go back to D.C. this soon. And she's like, well, you know, my husband, Philosopher Henry, you know, he's being, he's being, he's being a bore. He has a telephone interview with Bob Dole tonight. And Jim's like, well, go ahead and hop on, hop on board this plane. I'm going to get Toby, the pilot, to start the damn engine. Okay, so it's 6.45 a.m. Southwest flight 25972 departs from Baton Rouge bound for Dallas. Betsy looks out the window as the plane takes off. Longing for the ranch, but missing Jim. Of course, sitting with her is Claude. I know why Claude didn't want to go at first. Uh, JR told me after spring break, that Claude was getting ready to go uh, to New York with Janet, his second wife, to adopt some Indian boy in, in, in New Delhi. Of course, J.R. said that's ultimately what led to the end of their marriage. Okay, 12 p.m., on the last flight home, Betsy sits next to her friend Fern, who had met her in DFW. And now she's flying with her back to Midland. 1 p.m. After church, along with Sunday school and lunch at the Holy Spirit Club, JR goes by Napal to see Kristen. And he's like, well, is Kristen around? And Pulse is like, I'm sorry, JR. She just stepped out with, uh, stepped out. Her father was with her. And went, well, what she didn't tell him was that, uh, uh, Kristen was out on the back patio of the dorm talking to her father, who was in Lubbock on business for the week. 4 p.m. Back in his dorm room, Jared is sitting around moping when his dorm room phone rings from the ranch. It's his cousin Thomas. And Jared's like, look, I want to thank you for taking over the ranch from Kyle. His attitude was getting sour. And Thomas was like, hey, I spoke to your mom. We're all having spring break in Gainesville. I want you to come along. And, and Jared's like, well... You want to, I want to change your plans. Uh, Joe's like, well, I got this in a big convention in Garland. And I was like, well, you know, I'm going to change your plans because your dad has been hearing about you going to this uh, NFB convention. He fears you're going to become a target for Jim Bob. Uh, Jim Bob's negligence running the chapter. And Joe's like, damn it. Why is daddy stepping into this? And and and, and Thomas is like and Thomas like Thomas is like, I'll tell you why. None of us like Jim Bob Horton. And you always have 
to take the fall for him. You're not doing it this year either. And Jerry's like, well, since you saved Kyle from from uh, Christina, I'll consider it, Jerry said. And Brent and, 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 and Thomas is like, Kyle is uncivilized. Uh, it is uncivilized Dustin. He needs to leave the ranch. And Jared's like, why don't you take Kyle's shares? And <laughs> Thomas is like, well, he already sold me half. That was music to JR's ears, no doubt. <laughs> I bet. 6 p.m. Meanwhile, back at the ranch. No, 4 p.m. Meanwhile, back at the ranch. No, at 6 p.m. Kyle approaches Betsy in the den with a clipboard and signs some papers. And Betsy's like, well, I hated to see Kyle go. And, and Thomas is like, look, he's a new man. Plus, it's a pleasure to run the ranch again. Keeps me from having to move to Florida with Rachel and little Thomas. Besides, Madison and Rachel went back to Weatherford. Oh, we know what they're poking around about. We know what they're poking around about. I mean... Come on. It's not that hard to see. Okay. That's the wrong one. Got to look for it. I'm sorry. We got to be patient. Here it is. Praise the Lord. I think. I hope. Okay, 9 a.m. At the Tarrant County uh, Coroner's Office, Rachel and Madison poked through some information about the death of Jonas Salt. And Madison's like, look, I just want to know about the death of the Dr. Jonas uh, Salk. And a Dr. Uh, Middleton says, look, that's classified. Look, go back to Weatherford and see Terry uh, Greenleaf at the hardware store. He has some information to help you folks. The doctor does show a certificate, a certified copy of a death certificate. Dr. Salk was killed February the 28th, 1967. He wasn't buried by his wife and family until March 9th. At the same time, JR is in his sick bed with a cold and cough. Mike Fields brought some cough medicine, orange juice, and vitamin C. Told JR to rest the rest of the morning. He called JR's organizational behavior professor, Sarah Hatfield, saying that JR was sick. 
1 p.m. At Nap Hall, John Clifford Hay is advising Christian on how to handle J.R. And he's like, look, if he wants to see you, let him come see you. Otherwise, give him space. And 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 Brent, you burst in and say, "Hello, hello, Kristen. Let's go out for lunch." And Kristen's like, "Well, I'll go get my coat." And John's like, "And why are you interested in my daughter?" And 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 Brent, you were like. I'll do it. Come on. You can join us for lunch, too. And John's like, I think not. I have a business appointment at two. Now, you haven't answered my question. What are your intentions towards my daughter? And Brent was like, Strictly business. We can have we can have breakfast tomorrow. And and John's like, no. I have a business breakfast tomorrow. I'm gone. You felt kinda awkward. No, he felt kinda awkward. Kristen told me that her father could sometimes be severe. Almost militaristic. Other times, quiet, retiring. And 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 I said, now I said, now you don't have to leave. We can be friends. Okay, so at five p.m., uh, uh, David shows up to take Christine for an early dinner out. When the phone rings. And it's JR. He says, Got another letter today. I got a second con- copy of Jennifer's engagement certificate and a wedding invitation. And Christine's like, and, and Christine's like, What's it to me? And JR's like, if, Jay, if John Henry bothers you again, send his butt to me. <laughs> He's like, send his butt to me. I'll take care of him. 5.30 p.m. At the Holy Spirit Club, Jesse is studying before dinner when Christian's father shows up. And he's like, do you remember me? A couple of months back. And 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 just like Yes. You're with Kristen. And 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 John Hayes like I need to know. Is Brent interested in Kristen or not? And Jesse's being like naive. She's like, are you in love with him? And she says, he says, I'm not. Look, she's my daughter. Okay, 6.30 p.m. Jaron takes his, it's a.m. rather. Jaron takes his waffles from the Holy Spirit Club and sits down in the lounge to call to his mother. Good morning, Mama. Put, put, please put me on the speakerphone. And and, and Bess is like, oh, all right. I don't like you, but okay. And and Joe's like, Christine, I saw the engagement certificate of Jennifer Bowers. August 18th, 1995. I think it's amazing. And Christine's like, suck it up and get over her. And Jared's like, I have. 
I have better things to do. My final paper, for one. Okay, so it's 7.30 a.m. Brent is writing his editorial for the week when... And walks in is his sister. And he's like, hey, Ann, can I get you some donuts and, or juice? And Ann's like, thank you, no. Let's talk. And and, and, and Brent's like, well, <laughs> I'm going to do, well, so serious. What's going on? Why haven't you contacted our father? Too busy doing newspaper work? I see how you feel. What's going on? Brent Clark. A man who's too big for our father. King Brick. Chasing girls who don't want that. And and Brent's like, I run my professional life. I run my professional life like I want. You disgust me so damn badly. And Brent's like, You're jealous. You hate me become my mama's boy. So why don't you take your daddy issues someplace else? It reminds me of that Offspring song that came out, I guess, late 90s, early 2000s, called He's, he's, got, um, he's got Issues. And she's got issues. Uh, you know, I think that's true because, well, <laughs> and did. And <laughs> we're going to see in, in, in future seasons how she puts them in play. 8 a.m. at a Western University College. Uh, Pratt Hall. Elizabeth Marie is visiting with Political Science Department Chair Solomon Fry. And she says... Look, I enjoy my thesis. I'm doing a lot of good. I'm doing a lot of good work. But I have to be reassigned. I need an advisor. And, and Dr. Fry's like, no. The committee has already chosen one. <laughs> Learn to live with him. Dr. Fry, really? And and, and was Mr. Reese, he sees so demanding. And and, and and Fry's like, Yeah, I know that. He's hard driving. But that's what you need for a public policy pieces. Yeah. This was a sign of things to come. By the end of the semester, I joined forces with Daddy. To remove, remove two future endowments from the Hendrick family. It wasn't restored again until 2001. 6 p.m. Christine is in the living room when she gets a call. It's John Henry. And Christine's like, I told you to stop calling me. And and John's like, let's meet in the public place. And we'll discuss this. ZD's at 8. And, and uh, let me tell you something. This is something you ought to know. Oh, about uh, four and a half years before, Dare said something kind of off color, and Christine hauled back and punched the hell out of him. And Christine says, "You don't know who you're fooling around 
with Chrissy said, hanging up the phone. 6.30 a.m. At the hardware store, the owner spilled uh, the beans. Apparently, apparently, Grandma Elizabeth had an affair with, Jonas, with Dr. Jonas Salk. But then, he being her ugly, she got in, got creepy. So, she endorsed Jeremy Swain ordering the hit on Jonas Salk, who fled to Weatherford to see her cousin. 6.45 a.m. Karen and Clark, and the PM letter, they're having dinner at Alba Gardens. <coughs> Anne orders a virgin margarita. <laughs> Plenty of those. Yeah. And Jared's like, you know, your parents and my uncle and aunt are good friends. And Anne's like, that's why I asked for this dinner. <coughs> I'm aware that Clint is helping you with your paper. And and, and then Jay was like, Brent is a good researcher. And Anne's like, too good. He puts me to shame. And, and, and J.R.'s ears perked up, and he says, I'd say you're jealous. And, and Anne's like, not jealous, just realistic. And she says, he's living way beneath the potential our father taught us to have. And J.R.'s like, well, don't you worry, none. We'll fix that soon enough. Okay, 7.38 p.m. Carmen picks up Jr. to go study with Brent. He picks up the phone and calls Frank Murphy. Supreme Court clerk for Sandra Day O'Connor. Yeah, Frank. My father said... You can do me a solid. Zonderband polling data surveys from Hendrick Foods economic data. Yes, forwarded to Brent Dark Clark at Pine.com. Yes, sir. You'll get a signed copy of my thesis someday. He ends up being a signed copy of his book. 7.45 p.m. Madison comes home greeted by some flowers home from Weatherford. <coughs> now, normally you think, well, didn't Kyle just cheat on her? Not too long ago with uh, uh, Christina. This chair is a note. During the time after Grandma's death, Kyle had an emotional affair with Christina. He said he would never sleep with her because she betrayed him. That was some pre. Um, episodic thing. Um, spring 92, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Gerald said he went to Texas Tech to get away from it. Kyle's upset because, well, Christina betrays him, so he latches on to a couple other girls and then Madison. Gerald like, hey, quick. Madison calls her brother, who says her mother 
has the same evidence about Grandma Elizabeth in the attic that she'd gone to Weatherford for. At the same time, a knock at the door at Kristen's dorm room. Kristen answers. And it's Jesse. And Jesse is like perky angry. And she's like, all right, out with it. Why are you hanging out with my man? And Chris, Kristen's like, well, I don't see how it's any of your business. And she's like, well, your father came to me. Kristen, he is, Brent is my boyfriend. And, and Kristen, like hand on, on hips. Brooklyn, Brooklyn accent. What we have is a business relationship. Nothing more. I want JR. Jennifer Bowers and Karen Kreider wounded him so badly. That he actually needed meat building up. Now, if you're smart, little lady, get the hell out of my dorm. <laughs> uh, that Brooklyn accent, I've seen her shed a few times. No doubt, Brent. 7.55 p.m. Dr. Fry approaches Dr. Danny Larson to inform him that Melissa Marie wants a new academic advisor. And Danny's like freaking out. No! No! I've been with this people all the way through her senior year. And this is how she replaced me? Okay, what's with me? Is upstairs in the computer lab where she sees Danny coming towards her. <sighs> Terrified, she gets up and walks away. And he grabs her. No indexes. Do better on this paper. Woo! Here's where some more violence takes place. <laughs> 8 p.m. Donna drives Christine to Zedi's, where she meets John Henry. What the flip do you want now? Just a little favor. I found out that your brother has been snooping around Jennifer's curriculum in London. And I wanted him to make it stop. And, and Christine, Chris, Christine gets in her face. Or what? Or I tell your boyfriend just how mild you are. Okay, Christine loses her temper. <laughs> She, she knocks him out on the face and punches him, knocking his butt over on the table. And she's like, keep away from me and my boyfriend. Stop calling me. Woo. There we go, man. The hard stuff. Okay, so now it's the eighth. We skip, we're skipping it. No, no, we need to do the seventh first. Sorry about that. I keep forgetting. Let's see if this is it. Not true. 
yes, the seven. J.R. is at Crockett House having breakfast, reading the newspaper where he sees the top article that his economics professor, Don David Galworthy, was receiving the Professor of the Year Award at UT Arlington. 9.50 a.m. J.R. arrives early at the at his organizational behavior uh, class, having finished his letter writing assignment. He was the CEO in this case study of a major waste management uh, company, in which he kindly castigates some of the bosses on their reluctance to find a decent dump site for some asbestos in in, uh, cooperation and compliance with the legislation in the state of Pennsylvania. Oof. (laughs) Environmentalists, unions, mess. For sure. 1 p.m. Eastern. At the Small Business Administration, Jim is at a manager's meeting, but there is trepidation among some of the lower top brass because Phil Later's wife was in attendance. And as usual, she was grumpy, contending with her husband's about ideas at the meeting. 2.30 p.m. Eastern. Jim arrives at uh, Genevieve's Pharmacy in Arlington, Virginia, to pick up some of his medicine. The toll of the meeting had left Jim feeling grumpy. So when he was to come back, he was going to be playing a game of golf with angel investor and oil capitalist Gordon Gecko. Gecko will be flying into Houston tomorrow morning, coming back to Washington, D.C. on the 19th, only to return again the morning of the 24th back to Houston. 3.55 p.m. J.R. is in his suite living room crying when there's a knock on the door. It's Grandma Mary. Now, darling, what's wrong? Harry Fane. Harmon says in my contention paper, it's weak on statistics and data. I've been so sick and twisted inside, Grandma. I almost hate myself. <clears throat> Carl has to work and, and and Donna has to work and teach. But you ain't staying on campus this evening until until I think you're ready to come back. I called Carmen. He's picking you up at six. And me as well. And we're going out to Olive Gardens for dinner. 6.30 p.m. Eastern. Jimmy's Jimmy's having chicken fried steak dinner with his dream team. Trying to work out a plan of attack. to get after the Clinton administration. And what he sees is gross laziness in dealing with the economy. 7 p.m. At a private room, Jerry is having dinner with his 
uh, grandmother and Reverend B. Granholm of the Assemblies of Christ. I pulled my heart out to the two about my mental and spiritual turmoil inside my mind since Grandma Elizabeth passed away. Although I was getting closer to God, I was still feeling sort of mixed up. The Reverend recommended I go see Reverend Steve Moore at the Holy Spirit Club. Okay, so now uh, we've got to go with the uh, here we go, the 8th. 7 a.m. Madison is looking through uh, the Grayson Attic at the mother's home in Madison. She finds stolen episodes of a diary of Elizabeth Swain that the late Minister Grayson kept on behalf of Jeremy Swain. February 21, 1967. Dear Diary, I can't take this anymore. Dr. Sulk is coaxing me and threatening me at the same time. I'm afraid of what Betsy might tell Jeremy. I tried telling Jonas that it's over because I feel bad for cheating. Uh, on Jeremy and him cheating on his wife but he refused to admit the truth I give it one week but then I have to go to Jeremy I have to end this once and for all because earlier this month Jonas said that he would be better off dead than living without me. March 9th, 1967. Dear Diary, Lord, 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 what have we done? Jonas is dead. And the authorities in Fort Worth are sending him back to Odessa to be buried by his folks. Jeremy is drinking again, and I have to get away from the ranch, from everything. John Dustin will protect Betsy from her father, if need be. <laughs> John Dustin will protect Betsy from her father, need be. Uh, hate to pass judgment on J.R.'s father, but may have to. I have no choice. I just give her the bail. Don't mean to give disrespect to the dead. But at that time in the 1960s, on the fair, it was just a bad combination. 9 a.m. Outside the ranch, Elizabeth Marie is, is crying. And, and Christine is like, What's wrong, Lizzie? It's my advisor. He's being demanding again. I need to spend more time with him in the library. And, and Chris, Christine says, All right, don't tell Mom. But I'm skipping class. I'm going over back over to the advisor and giving him a piece of my damn mind, Christine said. 
Don't bother. Better for me to deal with this now. Because hell is going to pay when Daddy finds out. <laughs> and, and Jim does find out. 9.15 a.m. In political parties class, Danny makes his final pronouncement. Remember, exam is on Thursday. And I would like to see your periodicals for your research paper, Danny says. As the class walks out and Christine walks in. What's a pretty high school girl like you doing here? I told you not to get too damn demanding with my cousin, Elizabeth Marie Hendrick. Good lady. Take your threats elsewhere. Christine throws him a right hook. You've been warned again. Keep it up, and you'll face the wrath of my daddy. Don't bother. I know. You must have an Emory and Harvard education. But down here in Texas, you're screwing with the big boys now. The Hendrick family. My daddy is going to tear you and the school apart. <laughs> Christine and that temper hurts. Oh. <coughs> 2 p.m. At the Holy Spirit Club, Jerry is confiding in Connie. Uh, Connie said, Murphy sent me a copy of everything from the Zondervan poll. I heard you gave current instructions to take the paper results of the polling data to Isaiah Friedman, Friedman's headquarters in Lubbock. Gone, he said. Thank you. Oh. Somebody reached out to me last night and said that you were really feeling down. That's why I asked for this meeting. And Jerry's like, it's about my lady friend, Kristen. I bought to the club a couple weeks back. I got scared because I thought it was a big rebound from Karen Crowder. Connie gets up from the couch and feel Sierra's leg on the chair. That was no rebound. He only dated Karen three months when she started playing around. You deserve somebody a lot better than that. Why aren't you see somebody seeing somebody? I was seeing uh, Justin Westerfeld from the club, but he broke up for me last summer, and I'm feeling lonely. And Gerald's like. Welcome to the Lonely Hearts Club here at the Holy Spirit Club. Any girl would want to have you, Gerald. And why are you so lonely? 
And Jill's like, sold it over since I found out my grandma was dying. A lonely existence will make it go crazy. And let me guess, Call, Charlie called you last weekend to see if you received an invitation to Jennifer's wedding. How did you know that? Stoney and I dropped by your dorm to see you. But you were out. Kevin McDonald told me that Charlie did this. And he is angry as hell with him. Not to mention, John Henry called me this morning. 4 p.m. Jim is in the U.S. House chamber, listening to a speech by House Speaker Newt Gingrich. He had heard that J.R. had bought his audiobook copy of To Renew America by the Speaker. And he asked J.R. Uh, to send it overnight so that the Speaker could autograph the the book cover for him. 8 p.m. Eastern. Jimmy's having dinner with Barbara Holland and her children. And she was still separated from her husband with what seemed to be no end in sight. Okay. Now we got to find the infamous February night. <clears throat> it's 9 a.m. Kristen is at the dorm kitchen making some coffee. She was eating cinnamon rolls for a light breakfast. Her father comes and sits beside her. Kristen, and Kristen, What's wrong with you? You're acting weird. Why did you go see Kit and Jessie? She called on me. She called me out and asked me if I was seeing print. I said no. Look, I thought Brent was a suit of yours. And I have to meet every man and get to know everything about them. Well, for anything. Here's the thing, okay? Jesse is jealous because she thinks I'm seeing Brent. I don't want Brent. I want J.R. Well, whoever it is, Brent or J.R., that person needs to come talk to me before anything happens. You're being an idiot. You're being an idiot, Dad. Get out. Fine. I'm flying back to Austin today. But I will come back sometime. And we will talk all about this. 11.15 a.m. After engaging in some small talk with Kristen, J.R. meets with Dr. John Greer. I was in his organizational behavior professor at London during the spring. She returned to Texas and her fiancé is in West Texas. Careful, Greer says. 
he better leave my sister alone. Jill said, Thank you, Mr. Greer. Thank you, Dr. Greer. He slips the professor $10,000. Okay. With this, I give the latest. I give it 3.3 sprites. Um, an Italian dinner with a grandma or close friends. And the engagement certificate for Jennifer Bowers. Brent. I gave it 3.3 women waters. Um, to see a punch out going on at that Zidi's Italian restaurant in Odessa. And to see a near punch out in a lecture hall at Odessa University College. There we go. That's the end of the show. Hope you enjoyed listening to the J.R. Henry Texan Gentleman. If you like what you hear, please subscribe. Become a part of the adventure. This is the James Henry Empowerment saying until next time, take care and get ready for the rest of the story. It's going to get more interesting from here. Take care and God bless you.